So we know that after Nixon resigned, his new um, vice president inherited that position, and that was Gerald Ford. So Gerald Ford is our only president to ever um, end up in that position without ever having a vote cast in his direction. He was not elected vice president. He was appointed vice president, and he was not elected president. He inherited that position. So... When he got into office, a lot of people um, were very, you know, confused. He was very new to the, um, you know, national stage. It was a very odd situation. So a little bit of background on Gerald Ford. He was a college football star. Actually, that's where a lot of people knew him from before he got into politics. He was a World War II veteran and a former congressman. So he did have some political background, um, but his presidency is essentially going to be worthless. And he really could have been, you know, an incredible president, but it didn't really matter. Um, well, everything that had gone down with Nixon really ref reflected horribly on the Republican Party. And after <sighs> the whole Watergate scandal, ultimately... Um, the Democrats were going to have a very easy time getting someone into office in 1976. So Gerald Ford will run in 1976, but he will lose. So um, he'll only serve two years as president, finishing up Nixon's um, initial second term. So the only thing that uh, Gerald Ford is really known for is two things. The first is issuing a pardon for Richard Nixon on any crimes that he did or did not commit. Um, so a lot of people were really upset about this. They accused him of a, um, making a secret deal with Nixon in exchange for the vice presidency. He would, you know, write him a um, pardon after Agnew resigned. So uh, after that happens in 1974, when the midterm elections come around for Congress, Republicans ended up losing 48 seats in the House of Representatives, which is m absolutely major. A lot of people said that this was the death of the Republican Party coming here. Now, obviously, we know the Republicans are going to very easily recover and get back into a really great place in the 1980s, but um, they were at a really deep low here. Um, the other thing that Gerald Ford is known for is a uh, a uh, program he put into place to try to help our, our economy. If you remember, our economy has really been struggling with something we call stagflation. And the program he puts in place is called WIN, which stands for Whip Inflation Now. And what you should remember about WIN is that it is a big lose. This is an absolute disaster. It essentially just makes everything way worse. Factories start shutting down and demand drops dramatically. Unemployment starts to rise. And this is pretty much the last nail in Gerald Ford's coffin. So when he ran for election in 1976, he loses um, to Jimmy Carter, who is elected. So as you can see by this electoral map, it wasn't that he was elected by a landslide. Um, as far as electoral votes go, Jimmy Carter only won by about 50 or 60 votes. Um, but people... Oof. Some people were voting for Jimmy Carter, but a lot of people were also vote, just voting against Gerald Ford and against the Republican Party. So the people who liked Jimmy Carter, what they liked was uh, a couple of things. Number one, he was a fresh face to Washington, D.C. He had never been in Washington before um, in terms of, you know, working in Congress or anything like that. He only had... Um, political experience being a one-term governor of Georgia. Um, so they knew that he had no ties, which meant that, you know, no one owed him anything. He didn't owe anyone else anything. Um, he wasn't going to be a puppet for anyone, which is definitely a big positive. Um, another thing that Jimmy Carter liked is that you can tell just by his face. This is someone who he's just very honest and genuine. You know, he wants to get into the office and, and do good things for good people. He's not really a power seeker. Um, and a lot of people really like that, especially coming off of Nixon and Johnson um, after Kennedy's assassination. The third thing that got Jimmy Carter a lot of votes was the fact that he was a born-again Christian. He got a lot of support from fundamentalists who are becoming increasingly involved in, the pol in politics throughout the 1970s, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. So from the very beginning of his presidency, that inexperience that people really liked about Jimmy Carter is going to hurt his presidency. Uh, while it's good that when he gets into Washington, he doesn't have any um, enemies, that also means he doesn't have any friends. So no one really in Washington has his back, not even really his own party. Um, he submitted... <sighs> 
sorry. He submitted several bills to Congress um, early on, but uh, they didn't really get much support, and most of them end up failing. Um, now, he does grant amnesty. Um, if you don't know what amnesty is, amnesty is a pardon, but for a political pardon. It's a pardon of political um of a political crime, basically a crime that someone commits for a political reason, that's what um, you grant them amnesty. And so Jimmy Carter grants amnesty to all of the men who had dodged the draft after Vietnam. Um, he was hoping this would help heal the country after the war, but instead it pissed off a ton of people. Um, if you're asking yourself why, the answer is because okay, sure, let's say you don't agree with Vietnam and you don't agree with the draft and you don't think these men should have been drafted, so you want to absolve them of that. But what about the men who were drafted and did volunteer and put their lives on the line, many of whom died? What about the men and women who volunteered to put their lives on the line? Um, we are just sort of like brushing what they've done under the rug here and acting like it wasn't necessary, like they died or sacrificed in vain. Um, so this is still a sore subject to this day. A lot of people were really unhappy about this. A guy named Barry Goldwater, um, he was sort of like the Republican of the 1970s, sort of the face of the Republican Party. Um, he said that this was the most disgraceful thing a president had ever done. Those are big words coming out of um, a presidency that resulted in an impeachment and a resignation. So throughout the 70s, our economic situation is going to keep declining. Foreign companies like Toyota are expanding so much that other companies at home like Chrysler are going to need federal loans to stay afloat. Jimmy Carter is going to pass a bill or try to pass a bill to encourage conservation of oil. But in the end, uh, the one they end up passing was very different from his plan. And many people took this as an example of his poor leadership. You know, he's not even really able to lead his own party. Um they're just sort of walking all over him. Now, one thing he does get done is he nominates a guy named Paul Volcker, V-O-L-C-K-E-R, to be the new head of the Federal Reserve. Um, and his stance on high interest rates and a long-term solution will eventually pull us out of, of stagflation um, once we hit the 1980s, which is going to be great. Um, but we won't see that economic um, growth until the 80s. It's still going to be tough here. <sighs> At the end of the 1970s. So, the demographics of the United States are still changing. People are still moving to the Sun Belt, giving it more and more political power. Um, if you can't remember what the Sun Belt is, it's the southern region of the United States. Um, right down here, the, sort of the sunniest part of the U.S. People are still moving there. Um, now, this is interesting because we're seeing it gain more political power because of its population. You know, states with large populations have more political power because they have more representatives in Congress. On top of that, we're also seeing increased immigration from Latin America. That's shaping our political voice. Richard Nixon's actually the first presidential candidate to ever um, go after the Spanish-speaking vote. So while we're seeing um, the population in that southern region increasing from Latin American immigrants and from um, some belt migrants, that also overlaps over the Bible belt. And that's going to um, we're, you know, we're seeing this rise in Christian fundamentalism. If you um, don't remember what fundamentalism is, that is the uh, belief that the Bible sh is literal. Um, so Christians who take the Bible literally, not all Christians do take the Bible literally. It's actually a very small percentage. Um, I, I, maybe not small, small, but not the majority by any means. So... Um, we're seeing that area that we would say is the Bible Belt, right? The South is gaining more political power all the time because it's gaining more and more people living there. Um, and then on top of that, fundamentalism is growing. So that power is growing. This is going to be a really big player once we get into the election of 1980. So we're seeing our baby boomers getting older. They've come of age at this point. They're in the job world contributing to society at this point. And so now that we've gotten to know them, we can officially name that generation and they're going to be called the me generation me and we call them that because it, that that generation a lot of uh 
the ideas were about, you know, self-gratification, what's going to be good for me at this exact moment, not a lot of long-term thinking, not a lot of what's good for the country or what's good for the world as a whole. It's a lot of sort of like selfish views. Um, that's why we saw the sexual revolution becoming so popular, drugs becoming so popular in the 60s, along with the anti-war movement. You know, it was like about, I don't want to go to war. I don't want to put my life online. It wasn't really about like what was good for the country as a whole. So, um, you know, example of this from 1965 to 1979 we see twice as many children born out of wedlock um, this me generation is going to start to become interested in uh, fitness and personal health bodybuilding is going to be more of a trend you know people exercised before this but it wasn't really um, a huge industry today personal health and fitness is you know more of a billion dollar industry and that's going to become more popular thanks to this me generation so if you see here on the slide, I've got this televangelist. An evangelist is a type of preacher, you know, very charismatic, outgoing, intense style preaching. Televangelists are preachers on TV. Televangelism is going to be a huge piece of the late 70s and 1980s. Uh, we see this revival of Christian fundamental, fundamentalism, like I said. And these guys are going to reach millions of viewers every day because they're preaching on TV. If you're trying to think of a tele televangelist today, Joel Olstein is a televangelist. By 1980, one in five Americans considered themselves to be a fundamentalist. That's just not how many consider themselves to be a Christian. That's how many cr Americans say they take the Bible literally. That's 20%. That's incredibly high. Um, some t famous televangelists are Jerry Falwell, who we'll talk about later on in the unit, or Pat Robertson. Many of you have seen Pat Robertson, whether you know it or not. He's actually one of the hosts of the 700 Club, if you've ever accidentally watched that on um, ABC Family or Freeform. Um, so these guys are going to hold a lot of political power because they're reaching a very large group of people, um, not only in the Bible Belt, but all over the country. They're going to um, oppose abortion. So we're going to see a backlash against abortion in the late 70s and 1980s. Um, we're going to see uh, the push for prayer in schools and things like that. So we're really seeing the line between church and state blurred a lot once we are getting up to 1980 because this ultra-religious group of of people is gaining a lot of political power and as their power increase they're going to start working towards finding a true conservative and getting that person in the White House someone who is not only conservative uh, politically but also has uh, Christian values and um, they want to groom that person and get them into the White House and ultimately their choice will be Ronald Reagan and he will be elected very easily in 1980.